the hope for social stability over this transition period is focused on that retraining because the doom of Skynet, the Skynet scenario where the robots take over, is not robots taking all of our jobs and it's certainly not robots in my mind coming and killing us. The doom of Skynet is the exacerbation of existing gaps in society and then the very logical responses by the people that are being left behind to vote for populist and nationalist agendas and redistributive agendas as opposed to the retraining that society can do to make sure that they are capable of moving into the industries and jobs that are showing tremendous growth. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day. Find out what it takes to truly discover what it takes to elevate your career within payroll as we meet with the industry leaders who are shaping the industry for tomorrow. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today I'm joined by author of new book, End of Jobs, Jeff Wald. Now Jeff Wald is the founder of Work Market, which is a platform for organising, managing and payrolling freelancers and contractors. A very successful entrepreneur that's actually recently sold that business to ADP. He's actually founded several other technology companies as well, including Spinback, a social sharing platform, which was eventually purchased by Salesforce.com. Jeff holds an MBA from Harvard University, and as well as being author of the new book, End of Jobs, He's also a producer of the Tony Award-winning Best Musical, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Jeff is a regular writer in Huffington Post and Forbes magazine and was named one of the 100 most influential people in staffing. Now, I'm really excited to have Jeff on the Payroll Podcast because he's going to talk to us about something that's front, mind and centre, particularly during this global pandemic, and that is the future of work particularly in relation to the payroll industry. And we're going to talk to that in the context of his new book, End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. So stay tuned, sit back, relax and uh, enjoy. Five quick questions. Tell us all what inspired you to write The End of Jobs. Well, first off, Nick, thank you so much for having me. I will tell you, One of the reasons I wrote the book was just an increasing level of frustration with people making predictions of the future of work without using data, without using historical trends. And so when I founded Work Market, which enterprise software to help companies manage freelancers, I founded the company in 2010 and the prevailing prediction from everybody in the world of work was that by 2020, 50% of the labor force was gonna be on demand. And, you know, that's an interesting prediction. And certainly for someone building an on-demand piece of software, it is a good trend. And so it certainly was included in all my investor decks. Look how huge this market is and how much it's going to grow. But I knew it was never going to be true. It was a ridiculous prediction based on no data, based on no understanding of corporate purchasing decisions. And it was very frustrating to hear everyone say it. And I would always say, why? Why? Why do you think that that, that's going to be the case? And as the decade started to unfold, fewer and fewer people would uh, run to that banner of 50% by 2020. And as we stand in 2020, the on-demand labor market, much as I predicted in 2010, is about the same size. (laughs) And so, you know, when I started writing the book, it was to bring some clarity just to the on-demand labor market. But as I began the exploration and began interviewing people, began researching, I thought, you know what, it's not just the on-demand labor market that has this gap between reality, data, and predictions. It's the entire labor force. So that's how the book came to be. Excellent. And I, I know we spoke a little bit off there, but certainly the, the audience here will be very familiar with the fact that the BBC uh, actually ran a report here in the UK that 97% of payroll positions are likely to be outsourced in the future and, and or, or taken over by automation and technology or or by robots as the article wrote now we know that these articles are often headline grabbing this one Mm -hmm. certainly was within the payroll community and at the minute um just to fast forward as well of course we're we're still in the middle of a global pandemic with covid19 and that's certainly changed the way that we're working in the future of work there's been a very uh, quick adoption of new technologies certainly here in the uk with the likes of remote working software like zoom and, and, and ms teams and so on and so forth I would love to find out a little bit more from your perspective as an expert in this field about a number one, you know, why the payroll community shouldn't be 
so concerned by studies like the BBC quoting statistics like 97% of, of, of roles being replaced by robots and also I guess how you see the future of, of, of the technology affecting the market as a result of this pandemic what things have you seen change particularly since you've written, written your book? Well, let's start with the BBC article. I mean, look, I have not read that study in depth, so I, I wouldn't be qualified to to comment on it just yet. But I will say this. To your point, it was headline grabbing, and as with a lot of articles, Oxford University study being, I think, the most well-known in the world of work, those headlines often betray the reality of the article. And the uh, reality of most articles on this are talk about the propensity of certain jobs to be susceptible to automation, not the much more in-depth analysis of the competitive environment, of other technologies, of the regulatory environment, of the customer service aspects of things that actually go into whether or not a job is eliminated. And then we'll, I'll, I'll go off on a quick tangent here with the story of the ATM, if you will. Sure. So when, when the ATM first came out, it uh, wasn't until 19, about 19, mid-1990s that it appeared in every bank branch in the United States. And at the time, there were 500,000 bank tellers in the United States. And do you know what every single article said? Much like this BBC article on payroll, they said, oh my gosh, all the bank tellers were going to be out of work. Sure. And over the next 25 years, bank teller employment in the United States in increased by 20%. There were more bank tellers. Now, some people looked at that and said, oh my gosh, you know, everyone that predicted the future of work is, is wrong and there are going to be more jobs. Well, maybe. And then everybody looked at the increase in the 20% and said, oh, this is a great example of cobots. The idea that some of our tasks are taken by robots for the bank teller, the repetitive high volume task, taking in money and giving out money. And the teller was able to come out from behind the bulletproof glass, at least we have bulletproof glass here in America, <laughs> and was able to use an iPad and upsell mortgages and investment products. And so that's an example of upskilling because of the cobot. And you look at it and you say, well, maybe. But a more in-depth analysis would say the biggest variable in bank teller employment wasn't the ATM, wasn't the cobots, wasn't technology. It was banking regulation in the United States that through a deregulatory movement, banks were able to compete in various other geographies, and there was a huge increase in the number of bank branches in the United States. And the bank branches nearly doubled, but the average teller per branch went from an average of 21 down to 13. And so the point, Nick, of the story is that any simple analysis that says, oh, well, because data entry and payroll can be done by automation, therefore all payroll people are going to lose their jobs, it's just way too simplistic and it belays the mass complexity that goes into labor force planning that involves regulations, the competitive environment, the, the customer service aspect, and a host of other things. And so I'd be very wary of any prediction that just says, oh, all these jobs are going to go because history of work shows us that's almost never true. Well, that'll be music to the, the ears of many, many Payroll professionals. And we're going to find out a little bit more about the book um, as well coming up in just a moment. What are, what are your thoughts at the moment then in, in, in the second part of that question in relation to the global pandemic and the future of work? Has that changed any of your thinking um, or have you been surprised by the, the, the speed of the response in terms of the adoption of technology during this crisis? So not at all surprised by the speed of adoption. One of the major things I talk about in the book is that you very rarely see huge moves in labor statistics outside of some sort of crisis. And so because of the crisis, we had this big, big movement. So when I'm asked this question, Nick, I broadly have two answers. One is, we just don't know yet. There is limited amounts of data. The book and my approach is very data-driven, very evidence-driven. And so I'd be wary of anybody making too many predictions based on the COVID pandemic and its impact, because we just don't know. That being said, here are a few things we think we know. Sure. We think that it is speeding up a series of existing trends. Now, some of those around deglobalization, decoupling of the U.S. economy from the Chinese economy and the host of spheres. Okay, that was a trend that was existing, and maybe this will increase that trend. The trend around concentration in our economies, 
the Amazons and other tech giants being able to accumulate ever more market power. Okay, we have some data on that as well. But on-demand labor, the idea that more companies will use freelancers, well, we have some trends that would say yes, as companies see, oh my gosh, if I had a more flexible workforce, I'd be better able to respond to huge drops in revenue or huge increases in revenue, okay? The adoption of robots and AI, again, anecdotally, we think that the conversation has started to shift because the cost-benefit analysis suddenly needs to take into account basically this sentence, well, the robot doesn't get sick. So on balance, maybe you'd see more adoption, but again, we have, no, we have very limited data on that yet. Here's the thing we do have data on, and it is the exact thing that you highlighted. The remote workforce pre-crisis was about 3% of the labor force. About 3% of people, more than 50% of the time, didn't go into, quote unquote, an office. During the pandemic, and it differs economy to economy because of the capabilities within that economy, but on average, 30 to 40% of all the developing nations' workforces were working remotely, keeping in mind that they basically were at their natural limit. There's huge parts of the economy that cannot work remotely, retail, transportation, entertainment, manufacturing, and things like that. So in the U.S., 42% is the natural limit, and it differs country by country. What happened, Nick, is the pandemic forced two important changes. One was a change on mentality. This idea that, well, I appreciate all the studies say that, that remote workers are more productive, they are more engaged, they have a lower attrition rate, they're happier, they cost me less. I get all that, but I still want everybody in the office. So that was the mentality change that needed to happen on that old school manager, the man or woman that just thought, yeah, I don't care. I just, I think presence equals productivity. I think magic happens when people are in the office together. Mm. That's number one. Number two was the technologies, the policies, and the procedures that companies had not put in place, whether that's local um, networks uh, that allow the VPNs, whether that's remote IP tunneling, or just access to systems if you're outside the company's four walls, those things had just not been put in place. And the pandemic forced companies in the matter of weeks to put in place things that they had been avoiding doing for decades. And so because of those things, the remote workforce, which had grown about 100% over the last 10 years, it had gone from about 1.5% of the workforce to 3% of the workforce, will now more than double once we get into a post-COVID world, God willing, soon. And it's going to double because the mentalities have shifted. People have said, oh, wow, people can be productive if they're not all together. And you can't roll back those technology things that have been put in place. So the remote work had always been driven by what we call a pull function, where it was the employee asking to work remotely and the employer mostly saying no for those two reasons we talked about. And now those two reasons are moving away and you're going to start to see a little bit of a push function where employers are going to say, well, if you can work remote, yeah, go ahead and work remote. And keeping in mind that when we say remote work, that means more than 50% of your time you're not in the office. So flexible work arrangements will be even more prolific. It won't just be 6 to 7% of the labor force. It's going to be 30, about 30 to 35% of the labor force that will have a more flexible work arrangement. Sure. As a really analytical uh, response, I really enjoyed listening to it. And I think that probably uh, gives a little bit of insight into the uh, level of data we're going to find in your book, End of Jobs, as well. Just before we, uh, we talk about the book itself, I'd love to just introduce... Um, to the to the audience, the fact that you obviously have a background in supporting payroll related um, issues as well. I mean, you, you you recently your business recently was purchased by ADP, the business work market, which was a a smart way to organise, manage, and, and payroll freelancers and contractors. So it's very clear you've got a good or an expert knowledge of those marketplaces as well. I wonder if you could just bring us up to speed in terms of your background then that led you to writing this book? You know, what was your history before and what was it that really drove you to say, you know what, I need to put pen to paper and get this published because the world needs this. What what, what was that journey like? Well, it was a six year journey. One of my frustration of people not using data had peaked about six years ago. (laughs) I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll write a book about this. I will bring some clarity to this discussion. But 
you know, I have written a book before. It's about raising children. It's called The Birthday Rules. I have no children. So having expertise in a subject does not necessarily stop me from writing a book. But this one, because of my time at Work Market. Work Market, we raised about 70 million from the leading venture capitalists in the world, Union Square Ventures, SoftBank, and a few others. And we are the leading piece of software for companies to manage their on-demand labor forces. And so in meeting after meeting, talking with CEOs, CHROs, and understanding over time the kinds of things that are driving labor force management decisions, that was a huge uh, insight into writing a book about thinking about the future of work. Because if you're thinking about how the world's workforce is going to evolve, and you're not using the mindset of the men and women that are making the labor force management decisions at the largest companies of the world, you got a big disconnect there. And so not only those conversations, which all started as sales conversations, of course, I mean, I was in that room to sell software, but they evolved into friendships. They evolved into interviews for the book. And so I interviewed several hundred people and I asked a number of them to be contributors to the book in the future of work prize, which, which we'll talk about later. Fabulous. So, from your book itself, what are the what are the biggest takeaways? If uh, you know, I'm going to put a, a link in the episode notes for those interested in finding out more about the end of job. So certainly um, take a look at the episode notes if you want to access a copy. It'll take you straight through to the link where you can uh, either download a copy on Kindle or you can buy a hard uh, a hard cover version as well. But what are the what are the key takeaways that someone could look to experience or, or, or get from the book? There there are certainly a few. One is that the robots and AI are viewed by many as the fourth big technological change we've gone through. So let's study the first three. And as you study the first three, you will see that we always end up with more jobs and a higher standard of living, but after a very difficult transition period, FYI, we're in the middle of that transition period now with robots and AI, you will learn that on-demand labor, while it is an important part of the labor force and has been for generations, is not the future of work in any way, shape, or form. You will learn that on-demand labor, though, is permeating the full-time labor force. And by that, I mean all the dynamics of that on-demand worker, whether it's task-based work or data-driven HR or algorithms allocating work or personal responsibility for your healthcare, training, development, retirement. All of those things are starting to impact every single worker, regardless of classification. And then last is that when we look at the data, and we start to break down the types of jobs that could be automated, the numbers of those jobs, and what might happen over time, we start to draw the conclusion that there will be no net job losses from robots and AI. That is not to say that there won't be a lot of job losses. There will be. But on a net basis, we will end up, again, in this change, with more jobs, not less. Could I check some um, statistics that I've read? I don't know if these are are similar to your research, but I read that there was... Um, they're going to be probably 75 million jobs displaced globally, but there'll be a net increase in total jobs by about 58 million by the end. Um, is that is that similar to the kind of data you've been studying, or is that are those statistics very different? Is that uh, from the World Economic Forum's report? It is correct. Yes, it is. It is. It is my favorite report. <laughs> I will tell you, if anyone out uh, is listening is going to read one thing on the future of work, well, first off. You should read my book. That would be number one. But sure. a close number two is that World Economic Forum report. And you are right. They do a very in-depth analysis, by far the most in-depth analysis I have seen. I've spent a lot of time with the people at the World Economic Forum, and especially on their future work initiative. They are amazing. And they do predict a 58 million uh, increase in the number of jobs globally. And it is a very eyes wide open analysis. And it is not an analysis based on conjecture, based on a few data points and then extrapolating something ridiculous. It is a very real analysis of the different types of jobs, their component tasks, which jobs are at real risk, which technologies are emerging at which points. And it is incredibly well done, but it is a five year look, not a 20 year look. Sure. So something that I think is quite interesting in your book is you um, talk about the history 
of work and you've, you've, you've talked about how businesses and, and employees have reacted to what you've termed the last three technological step functions and I, I'm listing them here that from your book you've got your mechanization electrification and computerization I wonder if you could just talk to us a little bit about what those mean and how how the future of work has changed each time we've gone through these technological steps sure well you know the mechanization people might remember from school taking place first obviously in in england in the textile industry and it is basically moving from hand and animal power to machine power for tens of thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years production was done by hand or strapping something to the back of an animal and suddenly we had machines the spinning jenny the weaving loom being the most famous technological innovations in the very early age of mechanization and it allowed for mass increases of production. We moved to the second, known as electrification, and that is flowing power into those machines. And in that time, we see the rise of the first big companies. We see the General Electrics, the Standard Oils, the JP Morgans start to rise. And that is power flowing through those machines, allowing for masses in, massive increases of productivity. And then the third is, a, is computerization. That is the beginning of the age of automation where computers can do a task or a very simple robot can do a task. And that started in kind of about the 1970s and is ending just about now as we go into the fourth change. Each time you had all of these doomsayers that would say, oh my gosh, because of the spinning jenny, because of the weaving loom, no one's going to ever have a job again. It'll just take 20 people to make all the clothes we need. or in the age of electrification, oh my gosh, railroads are crossing the nation and there's gonna be no need for artisans and no need for people that can build things. This is obviously the time in which you see the, the production line um, started by Henry Ford. And again, incorrect. And then as the age of computers came, people said, oh my gosh, we're never gonna need people and it's gonna be a mess. And again, for a period during those times, that was actually kind of true. You can look at manufacturing employment in the United States massively impacted by automation. It is really the first wave of robots. In the late 1970s, the first robots appeared in factories. They were basically mechanical arms coming off of posts, and they could do three things. They could paint, they could weld, and they could lift things. But Nick, that was enough to cause nearly a 40% reduction in manufacturing employment in the United States. It yeah. peaked at 20 million in 1980, and it stands at about 12 million today. And it didn't happen overnight, and it was slow and steady, and the robots got better at doing things and moved off and weren't just mechanical arms, but could do a host of other things. And people fear that same 40% reduction in services because of the advancements of robots and AI. But it's important to remember that over that period of time, yes, 8 million jobs in manufacturing were lost in the United States, but tens of millions of jobs were created in other industries. That's kind of the lesson of history. Have you ever asked yourself, how can I recruit payroll staff effectively? Please don't give up on your recruitment project just yet. Here at JGA Payroll Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top payroll talent. We also understand just how costly a poor payroll hire can be. JGA Recruitment are a niche payroll recruitment agency who will partner with you to resource payroll candidates who will improve both the accuracy and efficiency of your payroll department. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Five technical questions. What are you calling or what are you terming the, the, the fourth revolution, if you like? Would you call it roboticization? Are you calling it automation? Is there another name that, 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 you're, that you're penning to, to what do you think the fourth revolution would be as we bring in AI and robotics even more than we are at the minute? Because you mentioned then obviously robots have been coming in actually in different ways and guises for a number of years. It's not new, but we seem to be more in tune to what's happening and, and it seems to be a lot more rapid now. So how are you seeing the, the, the next revolution? What are, what are you terming that? So this is my first departure from my friends at the World Economic Forum. They are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. 
And I get that. I understand where they're doing it. Uh, I am actually calling it the first services revolution. And so services are going to be more impacted by this change. That is not to say that manufacturing is done being evolved. It will continue to evolve. Uh, but the rate of change within the manufacturing sector will start to decline in terms of number of jobs lost. We've actually been at about 12 million in manufacturing employment in the United States for some time. And so as a percentage of the economy continues to decrease just because the rest of the economy keeps growing or the rest of employment keeps growing. But the ability to use AI to start to recognize where there are repetitive high volume processes in service engagements allows for the creation of automation. The data entry and repetitive processes inherent in some legal functions, some accounting functions, in a retail environment, in transportation, those are things that in the very near term, when these are all part of the service economy, uh, are at risk for automation. And you are seeing it as Amazon automates more of its warehouses, as autonomous cars, although they are always on the horizon and I think they will be some time before they actually hit the road. But you certainly see it at the till in a retail location with more and more self-checkout kiosks. Those are, our, those are the early stages of services automation, which will impact millions upon millions of jobs. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking back, and you can you you can identify you, some, you almost forget that they're there. They kind of happen in such a over such a although it's a rapid change in sort of day to day life. The self service kiosks, the automatic check ins at airports, these kind of service things, we kind of start to take for granted. They sort of happen without you really know unless you're in that industry, you don't really notice it. You just suddenly realise there's a little bit more convenience and things are a little bit quicker. But you're absolutely right. Of course, that's having an impact somewhere else, and it's um it's interesting. I would, what I would add, Nick, is back to our earlier point. Think about waiters and waitresses. The technology has existed to replace 100% of those jobs. Full stop. The technology has existed to do that. We can have an iPad on the table. I don't need someone to hand me a paper menu and then for me to tell them through my voice what I want to eat. Then for them to write that down on a piece of paper and to physically walk it into a kitchen. That does not need to happen. I can have an iPad on my table. It can ask me all kinds of questions. Do you want a side with this? Can you kind of replace this with that? And it can electronically go into the kitchen. I don't need to talk to a person. And yet, very, very, very few restaurants have done this. Sure. Because can you know humans are a social animal. I don't, I don't want to just look at an iPad and do that. I, if I want to do that, I'd stay home. If I want to go to a restaurant, I want to say, oh, what's good tonight? What do you like? I want to have that banter, as most humans do. So, this so just because a technology existed to place something does not mean it goes away. Sure, sure. And this actually links to my next question. So you've, you've, you've started, I think, on a road, which is I'm really interested to find out more about. And I know my listeners will be as well. And it also ties in with, uh, I read a great quote. Um, it's from Srini Kutam, Chief uh, Human Resources Officer, ADP, of course, which, which purchased, purchased your last business. Well, he said, as, a, as executives think about the future of work, there is no better guide than Jeff Wald's The End of Jobs. Jeff's research provides insights into how the future may unfold, and Jeff identifies the next wave of technological change as the first services revolution, which, of course, you've just told us all about there. A conclusion that all of us will come to share. So what I'm interested to know then, and with that quote in mind, and with the kind of the path you just started to go down there before I cut you off, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons then to a future where companies and employers are relying more heavily on technology? What are the things that we should be looking forward to in particular? And what should we be nervous about? Well, first, let me start by saying that Srini is not only a wonderful person, but incredibly intelligent. And I was very grateful for that quote. He is one of the best CHROs I, I've ever encountered. Um, you know, it, it, it is very difficult to say, Nick. The, the reality is, is we don't know how the future unfolds. But I will tell you this, we get a, a say in how it does. And we get a say not only because we all, at least you and I, and, and hopefully many of your listeners live in democracies and we get to choose the men and women that represent us because the regulatory environment is one of the biggest influencers in the future of work. And so the thing that gives me the most concern when I think about society as a whole, because different industries are going to be impacted in different ways and different companies will adopt at different rates. 
the thing that gives me the biggest pause is the workers that will get left behind, the people that are working in retail, the people that are working in a number of other industries, data entry, that are going to need the retraining necessary to take the jobs that are created. So my analysis would say 10 to 15% of jobs over the next 20 years are going to be eliminated by automation. But more jobs are going to be created. But moving that and that 10 to 15% in the United States is upwards of 25 million workers mm -hmm. over a 20-year period that will need to be retrained. We have not, as societies, thinking through the first three industrial revolutions, done that well. And that has led to literal blood in the streets. You think about the period of revolution in the mid-1800s in Europe. You think about the labor force clashes that occurred in the United States, the Battle of Blair Mountain, the Ludlow Massacre, the Triangle Factory Fire. These are things that are horrific, with horrific loss of life. And they are caused because workers are being left behind. And they have no other choice but revolution in their minds. And so those are things that usually lead to populism and nationalism, things that historically have not served societies well. So that, that to me is my big kind of fear and takeaway that we need to really think about retraining and the hope for social stability over this transition period, in my mind, is, is focused on that retraining because the doom of Skynet, the Skynet scenario where the robots take over, yeah. it is not robots taking all of our jobs and it's certainly not robots, in my mind, coming and killing us. The doom of Skynet is the exacerbation of existing gaps in society. And then the very logical responses by the people that are being left behind to vote for populist and nationalist agendas and redistributive agendas, as opposed to the retraining that society can do to make sure that they are capable of moving into the industries and jobs that are showing tremendous growth. Sure. And over the longer term, then, what are the, what are the other pros perhaps we haven't necessarily thought a lot about for example you know the pandemic has been a, a terrible thing it's affected us worldwide um a, again another a, a terrible uh, huge numbers and, and, and loss of life as a result but there have been positives if i may use that um without trying to be flippant to this as well i mean for, in my example i live away from home to work um day to day but during lockdown i've been with my family for for 65 days now which is a, for me a, a rare treat to spend so much quality time with with, with my with my two children and, and my wife um, and they're you know always try and look at the the positive to what is a, a really a very negative situation if you are a payroll professional at the minute and you're nervous about the future you're nervous that your role might be automated what are the positives that, that could come from this and where where should they be focusing then what what pros should we be focusing on well, the first positive is, is I, I don't think that there are that many jobs within payroll that are going to go in the next five to 10 years. You know, once you get further out than that, who knows? There are a lot of great articles. Um, one of my favorite publications, uh, The Economist, talked about the false dawns in AI and AI winters that have occurred. This is not the first time that AI has been bandied about as a job killing technology that was about to sweep the world. This is like third or fourth time. And each time the promise of AI fizzled. And there is a lot of talk right now about the fizzling of this. Not that you'd go into an AI winter. This, this genie is out of the bottle. It is in a lot of corporations. But investment in AI is starting to curtail and adoption of AI is starting to curtail because you're hitting the natural limits of what this technology can do. So the idea that the machine is going to know exactly what needs to happen in every payroll scenario and all these other things is possible. It's just not overly likely in the near term. So let's start with that. The other thing is something that you touched on, which is a very clear trend in the history of work is the reduction in the number of hours that a human has to work in order to have an ever higher standard of living. 200 years ago, the average person worked about 3,000 to 3,500 hours a year to basically just scrape by and survive. Today, in Western economies, the average person works between 1,400 and 1,800 hours per year to have a standard of living that is mind-blowingly amazing. Wow, vast on average. Mm. And so it is a very clear trend that has continued since the age of computerization of the slow decrease in the number of hours worked. 
The average American works 1,780 hours. The average German about 1,450 hours. And within that, you see different regulatory models, by the way, right? The Rhineland model of capitalism versus the Anglo-Saxon model of capitalism. Again, to our point about the future is ours to shape, we can choose a more Rhineland model where workers have a bigger say. But let's leave that aside for a second. The decrease in the number of hours and the increase in leisure time, in family time, in arts and science and, and poetry and, and things like that, those are things that are allowed because we need to spend fewer hours working to be able to provide the necessities. And the necessities now include an iPhone, which is you look at that device, that device is more powerful than the technology that put the man on the moon, and you get to carry it in your pocket. So these are things that history shows us that just get ever better and ever higher standard of living at ever few hours on average. That is not to say that every human on the planet gets to enjoy that, sure. not by a long shot. But eventually, these things do permeate to all workers. And so we have, it leaves me with tremendous amount of hope that we will do this transition better. The transition will go much slower than people predict. And that future scenario, the rosy Jetson scenario versus the Skynet scenario, scenario where there's a robot in everybody's home doing your mundane tasks so that you don't have to cook or clean. The robot just does everything. That is the scenario I do think we eventually get to. But for those out there that think that they're going to have a rosy Jetson in, in their living room and their homes anytime soon, let me uh, dispel that notion for you. Well, robots are getting cheaper and more dexterous and smarter. It is important to remember that robots today remain incredibly expensive, incredibly clumsy, and incredibly dumb. <laughs> the idea that there's going to be a robot butler in your house anytime soon is legitimately laughable. It, it will not happen in the next 20 years, and that is a prediction. While I'm very wary of making predictions without data, that prediction, I, I, will, I will take any bets. <laughs> I think you've done a really good summary then of some photos to look forward to. It's interesting as we, I guess, year by year, we try and get that a little bit closer to what we uh, deem as being a, a family or, or, a, or a personal utopia and using technology to help us get there. With with some of the technologies that um, we're seeing at the minute, there's a couple that come to mind. Are there any that, that really excite you? So, for example, you know, I'm hearing a lot on the news at the minute about 5G. We're hearing a lot about blockchain and, and things. That, that I know it's a very difficult technology to, to do on mass due to its energy consumption but I'm assuming that will improve um, things like lithium batteries and how you know you're talking about changing the way that we 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 we're you know burning up our fossil fuels and things at the minute so are there any technologies out there at the moment that really excite you that you you know are looking forward to seeing them develop and and, and that you think might come into the market sooner than others uh, certainly well certainly it's not blockchain because I still don't really even fully understand what blockchain is or why it's so special but uh... Friends of mine in that space have tried to convince me of it for some time, still don't get it. <laughs> uh, but I do think that one of the things that you highlighted, the uh, battery storage and the ability to allow solar, wind, and other renewable sources to be generated in places that are, have abundant wind, abundant solar energy, and over transmission lines move to battery storage to allow for the intermittent supply needed that to me is an untold story as to the drop in solar and wind energy prices. They are now, I believe, uh, just as competitive on a kilowatt per hour basis than coal and oil and any of the other cheaper fossil fuels. And so the adoption of those technologies, whether you are a climate science denier, which I just don't understand, as I hope your, reader, your listeners have uh, come to understand, I'm a very data-driven person. Uh, um, but even if you don't believe the science, you just get cleaner air. Like, okay, maybe we're not boiling the planet. We're all not all going to die in 100 years. But uh, I don't know why anybody would be in favor of less pollution. So those technologies give me a tremendous amount of hope uh, for the near-term and long-term uh, benefit of humankind. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, interesting on the climate change one. I don't know. I'm hoping it's a real picture, but there was a photo released that I saw online of, a, of the Arc de Triomphe 
uh, during or pre-pandemic and and during lockdown and actually the clarity of the picture has improved so much due to the pollution being taken out of the you know not, not being as prevalent as day to day i'm hoping it's a true picture but it was really quite enlightening to look at whether it was or not uh, but one thing we have seen from this pandemic is um, how remote working can have an impact on climate change with reduced commuting um, and things like that so uh, you know, looking at those positives i think that's one that we probably hadn't considered at the start of this lockdown but actually the effects have been been quite considerable and that is true. That is true. We've all seen pictures of, uh, of of those types of things of fish coming back into the canals in Venice and and a host of other things during this this period that some have termed a slowdown, right? The great slowdown where we got a chance to reflect and see what mattered, and and we'll see if those things actually impact human behavior, if they impact corporate behavior, all the increased activism of corporations, all the increased caring and stakeholder approaches. Those may well be substantive changes that have huge impacts on the future of work, or they may be anomalies that uh, when people will revert to trend, we just don't know yet. So someone who, um, obviously, I'm asking you lots of questions, hoping to get some advice on how we see the the future of the market. And I am certainly hope this is giving some reassurance to to the hardworking power professionals that listen to this podcast. But what's the best piece of advice someone's given to you? Ooh, that is a great question. Uh, The best piece of advice to me and the one that I impart to anybody in startup world, so work market was my my fourth startup, is the key to success is getting knocked down seven times and getting up eight (laughs) and getting yourself up eight, I should say. And I like it for a few reasons, Nick. One is it's just very evocative. You can kind of see yourself getting knocked down into the dirt and it's get yourself up, right? There's no one giving you a hand to lift yourself up. You have to pick yourself up and I can always picture myself standing up, dusting, you know, wiping the dirt off myself and keeping going. Uh, two is the number, right? You know, in startups, you get knocked down again and again and again because, you know, you're trying something entirely new and the biggest data would tell, the data would tell us that you are most likely going to fail. And so you keep getting knocked down again and again and again. And so I love it for that reason. And the third reason I love it is it just strikes me as mathematically inaccurate. And yet, for some reason, it's persisted. <laughs> if I get knocked down seven times, I should get up seven times. I wouldn't get up eight. Unless, of course, I start on the ground, which I don't. I, I start on my feet. Sure, sure. I quite like that. That's good. That's good. But well, I mentioned in the introduction at the start, and I know we've touched upon it briefly, that there is, of course, a huge Future of Work prize competition. So, Jeff, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about that, what it is, and, and of course, why it decided to launch such a such an exciting uh, and and I, I guess high, he, I'll let you tell it. Tell a story about why I decided to launch this competition. So, as a part of the book, what I decided to do was with the contributors, and so I had asked thirty people to write essays on what they view the world of work to be in twenty forty, and obviously not just anybody. These were the men and women that are actually shaping the future of work. And I asked them, you know, can you write your vision for what the world looks like in 2040? And it's people like Andy Stern, who ran the largest labor union in the United States, people like Carl Camden, who ran one of the largest staffing firms in the United States, Johnny Taylor, who runs SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, and other people that are CHROs of huge companies, that are policymakers, that are the leading attorneys in the space. And I wanted to make it a competition. And so aping the X prize, which is one of the most wonderful organizations that I I know in terms of pushing human ingenuity, I said, you know what? I'll put out a $10 million prize. And I was comfortable doing that because it's 20 years from now. Uh, And so I have put the money aside that under every reasonable scenario would grow to, uh, to the 10 million at, um, at that point in time. And that was our friends at ADP made sure that I do that. I did that because they did not want me putting out a prize without the money uh-huh. behind it. And so, uh, you know, it has been super fun. I haven't formally issued the press release announcing it, but it's obviously in the book. So it's formal in, in that way. And of the 30 people I asked, uh, uh, every single one of them said yes. A few couldn't get their company's approval to do it. So just because you're a CHRO at one of the largest companies on the planet doesn't mean that uh, you get to do what you want. And a few people 
while they did get their company's approvals, just didn't meet the deadlines because, you know, this is a book and it does have a publisher and the publisher had deadlines. And so in a number of them did get in and then we selected the top 20 to, to be formally in the prize and compete. And I could not be more proud of the fact that they joined me on this journey. I could not be more excited about the pieces that they've written, which are just great and very, very different, Nick. I mean, some people have a very dystopian view of the world in 2040. Some have a very optimistic view. And one writer basically wrote, nah, it's going to be the same. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of robots here, a little bit of regulation there, but basically it's the same. I mean, he's a lot more eloquent than that, but still. That's must be quite nice to uh, to see everyone's different predictions. It makes you, does make you think even I'm thinking right now, you know, well, how, how I'd see it in 2040, there's so many things to consider. We've talked about a lot of these subjects already, all the way from, you know, climate change and the impact there to, to robotics, to, to new roles we, that are you know, not yet even determined, but we know are going to be displacing existing positions. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting. And of course, we can access some of these uh, through the book. Would that be correct for those that, that purchase and, and, and get themselves a copy? They are all in the book. My favorite chapter, chapter 10. Not only my favorite chapter because of all of these great luminaries that uh, participated, but it's my favorite chapter because I didn't have to write it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's certainly a chapter I'll look forward to, to reading. I'm sure my listeners will as well. So just taking that forward, and thank you for explaining that, that competition. I think it's very exciting and, and, and a great way of, uh, of, of rewarding one of those 20. And I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to find out which one, in my view, is probably the most accurate when I read it through. But what is something the readers then would be surprised to learn about you? Perhaps it's in the book, perhaps it's not, perhaps it's just, you know, it's, it's got you to where you are at the minute. But what, what's something that perhaps they, that they might be surprised to find out? Well, one of the things that I didn't talk about for the longest time was that my first startup failed and, and bankrupted me. Okay, wow. And so when I talk about that not getting knocked down seven times and getting up eight, it is very evocative for me, not only in the running of the startups that I have built and that have been successful, but in the overall narrative of getting knocked down professionally. I mean, I got the call from my mom do you need to move back home? And I didn't. I had a month of cash left. I, I had paid my rent already. And so, but I didn't leave my apartment, Nick, for upwards of a month. Wow. Just, you know, in a deep, deep funk. And, you know, I'd had the privilege of going to all these great schools and working at all these great companies, Harvard and JP Morgan and Cornell. And to be broke at 32 was devastating to me but as with the ups and downs in a startup you have to pick yourself up and you got to dust yourself off and you got to keep going and people are surprised about that only in as much as i had so much shame associated with it that i never told the story when people would say oh, you know, what's your career? I'd say, oh, I started a bunch of startups through various twists and turns. You know, this one got sold. I wouldn't say I started my first one. It failed miserably. It bankrupted me. I got super depressed. I didn't know what to do. And I was very despondent. But then a few years later, we restarted that same concept and we eventually, eventually got sold to Salesforce. I don't say that. I just say, oh, we built a company through various twists and turns. It got sold to Salesforce. Sure. And so it's only recently, after several big exits that I felt comfortable going through it. And that is just to my, due to my own insecurities and, and, and not capable of being vulnerable, but it is a part of my journey of becoming more vulnerable and addressing those insecurities to start talking about it. And so over the last few years, I have been talking about it publicly. Oh, well, good for you. That's a, that's a great story. And, I th and hopefully it will help those listening to this as well who you know, going through their own difficulties, not just to the pandemic, but maybe due to how they see the future of work. I'm, I'm sure that you've put some of those concerns to bed a little bit during this this, this podcast, because it is something that's um, affecting the mental health of pale professionals, certainly here in the UK. But I speak to a lot of um, people across the across the pond as well um, on, on a very regular basis. So I know also have concerns about how uh, and, you know, and, and which direction the payroll community and industry is going to take. So thank you ever so much for talking us through it. And um, last question I'd like to ask you, Jeff, before we go, if you could sum up and this 
not going to be easy because you've got an entire book dedicated to it. And just to remind listeners, there will be in the episode notes a link to the end of jobs, the rise of uh, on-demand workers and agile corporations, so you can purchase a copy. But if you're able to summarise either the book or the future of work in a short sentence or statement, how would you sum that up? I would say that the history of work and the data points to very slow movements in an ever better direction. I think that's a great way to finish today's Payroll Podcast. So thank you so much, Jeff Ward, for joining me today. It's been a fascinating journey through, uh, well, many, many facets and, asset and, and, and different angles to in relation to the, the future of work. It's been really, really exciting for me to listen through it. I've taken lots of notes, which you may have heard me typing away in the background because I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. But for all of you listening today, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope it's helped you uh, like it's helped me. And um, I'd like to thank you again for, for joining me. And of course, the link to the book will be in the episode notes, so please do download the link and, and grab yourself a copy as soon as you possibly can. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you so much for tuning into the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment. If you need help with a current payroll vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time.